All right, kia ora everyone. This is John Cook uh, from Waka 9. Uh, welcome to uh, From the Edge, uh, what's next for hospitality. Uh, we're a couple of minutes past the hour, so we're gonna get going. And I'd uh, like to uh, introduce uh, David Truebridge and our special guest, uh, Danu Kennedy. So um, I will get out of the way and we will get Danu and uh, David, there we go. David and his very snappy red v-neck coming in live and direct from New Zealand and, and Danu, our new friend, uh, Kiwi friend, uh, designer, great designer, hospitality designer uh, based in Brooklyn. So um, without further ado, David, I will uh, turn it over to you. One, one comment, um, we've got quite a few questions to uh, answer for the Q&A session and we've also tailored uh, the discussion today based on your input, so thank you for that. We'll do about 30 minutes plus or minus of discussion with Danu and David and then 10 to 15 minutes to wrap it up uh, with Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please submit it through the Q&A feature uh, of Zoom. So with that, uh, to thank you, and uh, David, over to you. Uh, kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, John, and uh, hi, Dino. Thank you very much for joining us today from New York. Hi, David. Thanks for joining everybody. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Um, it's it's hot summer. I heard you were sweltering there when we last talked, and it's it's midwinter here. And as you can see, I'm in a jumper, and it's cold. It's quite interesting the sort of contrast we're having. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, it's very hot and humid over here for sure. So probably polar opposites at this point. <laughs> but you're originally a Kiwi, so you you know about that. I am exactly, exactly. I've been over here for about nine years now, but always coming home to visit. Uh, so yes, for sure. So, but we're talking about hospitality, which is the area which you work in. Um, and hospitality is about people, isn't it? It's about people getting together and sharing and being in spaces and, and, and all the sort of social interaction which humans are all about. And suddenly now we've got COVID and we can't do that. So how, how does hospitality and COVID kind of work together? I mean, that, how are you coping with that? Yeah, I mean, it's been tough. There's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars, a lot of hotels actually, you know, really being, um, you know, completely confronted by this um, experience and obviously across the world having to shut down. I mean, um, you know, I think for us at the moment where, you know, the conversation is around what people will feel comfortable, um, you know, in this sort of new world, how do people want to socialize, what health parameters do we have to maintain in order for them to do that safely. Um, but, you know, I do think that socialization, you know, humans are social creatures at, at their core and, um, you know, hospitality spaces, especially in cities like New York, are really some of the only places that you can really get together. You know, our apartments are so small, they're very small spaces. So, a lot of our socializing happens in um, in hotels, you know, whether it be the bars, restaurants, lobbies, et cetera. So I definitely don't think that will go away. I think that that has already started to return here in New York, um, but we are going to have to look at, um, you know, furniture layouts, floor plans, um, and essentially the groupings that these spaces facilitate we're going to have to look at how those um, cope with our new parameters. Mm. I mean, w one sort of taking that, that theme a bit further, one sort of instance of travel is, is the kind of check, say, say the check-in, for example, you know, you, 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 or, or in, a, a, in a restaurant, it's, it's, it's the people you meet, it's, that, it's the happy face, who, the guy who you remember who checked you in at the hotel because he welcomed you and he said some nice things about you and New York and, and the waiter who gave you a, a nice smile. Um, you know, those human interactions are, are, are so much part of, of, of what, who we are and the beauty of being in those places. So what's going to happen? Are we going to have um, machines to check in and, and robots to deliver our stuff in, in, in the cafe? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think this is a funny point because... Um, I actually feel like pr prior to COVID, you know, technology has been sort of taking over, 
you know, slowly um, for a while now. And, you know, a lot of hotels and properties over here, you've actually started to see this exactly as you're saying, self check in um, happening. And th that human interaction goes away at the point of check in. But I think that it's being replaced by there actually being a bit of a value system shift in where you get that interaction. So I think people are going to start doing self check in, they're going to rely on technology for that. But what you'll see in hospitality spaces is that um, that sort of interaction is then something that you get in the restaurant or the bar or in another form. And something I like about that is that it actually becomes less formal. It becomes a little bit more natural because you can sit at the bar and say, you know, look, I've just arrived from overseas, you know, tell me about the neighborhood. And you're kind of having a little bit more of a free flowing interaction than the interaction you might have with someone at the check-in experience. Yeah, I, I, I like that because I always feel slightly uncomfortable at the sort of rather obsequious nature of some of the big hotels and the check-in process. Yeah. Uh, and, and if it's more casual and relaxed, more human, I, I, I'd go with that. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a nice way as well for you to enter a space because you can then kind of um, find your own way a little bit before you're confronted with a very formal check-in process. Mm. And, and another is issue that's happening is, is um, change of use of streets. Um, mm. I, I gather that, that restaurants are, are moving out onto the streets and taking over streets. And for me, that is the most wonderful thing to hear. I, I mean, I... I yeah, I'm not a city person and I really struggle with the noise and the stink of the pollution of streets and the, I can't believe it when I see people sitting in a, in a street cafe with a diesel truck right there next to them and this engine is still going and, and the fumes pouring out over them. So yeah. if we can clear the streets of traffic and, and have, have all this sort of pedestrian area for bars and restaurants and you can spread people out, that's great. I, I love that. Isn't that a bonus? It's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, New York actually is a, a really easy to city to get around on foot. And I think that having this, um, having this sort of, you know, I guess shift of, of people saying, hey, you know, the human, the human walk around is now king. The traffic is, is sort of going to the second, second tier. And it's, it's amazing. I love it. It's exactly as you're saying. I mean, I don't think anyone really loves that experience of, of fumes and traffic and everything mm -hmm. while they're trying to socialize. Um, and the other thing that it's been um, hugely impactful on is obviously businesses because so many bars, restaurants had to close down because no one is allowed to go into interior space. Um, and so the city has given back in that way where they've said, okay, fine you know, cars, you go away and, and people can occupy the streets and you do get a really nice sense of community through that too, because you actually are seeing each other out in your daily lives again, which is amazing after being quarantined for so long. Yeah. Um, the, obviously the next question is, is what happens in winter? I mean, I, I love the outdoors and I love to be out in, in the weather, but <laughs> not so much in a New York winter. So, so then what happens? Do we have to design new kind of, uh, uh, internally heated pods for people to sit on the street? Is that the next stage? Yeah, well, you know, some interesting examples, again, that I had seen um, dealing with this problem prior to COVID were um, particularly hotels that had, um, you know, a substantial exterior footprint that obviously in summer they had their, you know, gardens and what have you. Um, but in winter, what they've done already, because obviously square footage over here is, a, you know, it's, it's so profitable. So, you know, the way that they dealt with the seasonal change already was actually, as you're saying, having basically temporary structures. So, you know, there's a hotel here, the Hoxton Hotel, that uh, in summer, it's got a beautiful courtyard. Um, and in winter, they actually do have temporary domes that are really interestingly designed. They're... Um, you know, uh, basically designated for about, I think, six to 10 people. So that's pro-COVID anyway, you know, that sort of group of people. Um, and other examples is there's a really um, funky sort of restaurant here called Roberta's Pizza, and they had always had a, a, a canvas tenting structure with an outdoor fireplace that they just put up in winter too. So I do think that there's... Um, 
ways that we can still capitalize on that outdoor space if we are looking at this sort of ban from interior environments, <laughs> you know, more long term. Um, but it's, I think we're going to see some real, you know, ingenuity and some creative responses mm -hmm. to that. Great, great opportunity for us designers. I love the idea of the, the outdoor fireplace sitting around yeah. a fire. It's great. Oh, lovely. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> When we were talking earlier last week, you, you talked about a, a hotel you stayed up upstate in New York, Maram Hotel, um, which had, had slightly changed the way in which it sort of allowed you to enter in your rooms. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so one thing um, that I noticed about that property, it's a beautiful beachfront property in Montauk. It's boutique, it's, you know, all natural wood. It's designed so that essentially all of the guest rooms are um, directly open to the exterior and you can enter them from the sand dunes um, and I just you know their public spaces as well were very exposed to the outdoors and they were reachable you know without going inside so one thing that struck me about that was that this sort of low-lying and um, exposed uh, entry to the outdoors from your guest rooms was basically the most attractive you know, hospitality experience in a COVID time that I could think of because you didn't have to walk through a lobby, you didn't have to come into contact with any strangers if you didn't want to, and you were constantly getting fresh air. So I think that those are some things that make people feel safe and secure and okay to be staying outside of their homes right now. Um, and the way that this property was set up, it was sort of almost feeling like a I guess a bit of a, you know, a very luxury and, and um, beautifully designed but motel structure where you're kind of much more independent within a, a footprint of a hospitality space. So, you know, I thought they'd done that really well. But how does that relate to sort of bigger style, um, you know, multi-floor hotels? Is, is it possible to do that or is there always going to be a problem there? You know, I think that it's going to depend on um, a lot of, you know, developers and their attitudes towards this, you know, sometimes um, it's probably going to take a little longer, I think, to see how quickly the people with the money are going to respond and allow people to push the boundaries with that. But I personally think it would be crazy not to. Um, mm. I think that our reliance on air conditioning, you know, elevators, um, these interior cores that you know, basically shut nature out um, has really been challenged through COVID. And I think that responding to that by bringing a connection back to the outdoors, nature, fresh air um, is what we have to do. You know, I think we, we really need to protect each other by allowing ourselves to exist within healthy environments. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I, I'd love to see that, that shift. And <clears throat> so that, that's the kind of, that's us connecting to, the, to nature outdoors. One of the things that we try to do with our designs and our work is is, is to do the opposite as well, is, is to bring aspects of nature back inside and, and, and recreate some of those feelings to, to energise and enliven and enrich our in, interior spaces. Um, <clears throat> do you think this will continue to happen or will we sort of ra rather sort of ignore the inside and look more to the outside? Um, you know, no, I think it will continue to happen and I think that it's probably going to... I mean, exactly as you're saying, you know, this connection and bringing that indoors, I think, will happen um, and more and there'll be a need for it more. I think people mm. want to feel that when they're in interior spaces. And, you know, as you said before, we can't avoid weather conditions. We can't always be outside. So I do think people will, you know, obviously need to rely on the indoors um, and that will continue to happen, you know, even in hotels, even with, you know, bigger properties. But I do think that people will want to see more of a connection to nature through design, exactly as you say that you guys do. I think that, that that's going to be more and more in demand yeah. as time goes on. That, that's great news for us. And, and it yeah. fits with my philosophy because I just, you know, I think nature is so important. I think we've tended to think we rule it and we can do without it and actually it's buying back isn't it yeah exactly and and nature has you know been thriving right you know humans have had to be you know locked inside and it looks like it's been amazing for the environment so it's it's really kind of put us on the spot in a good way i think yeah 
Can I ask you about WELL, the, the, the WELL um, building standards? Um, we're working with them in the States because uh, we like to sort of fit into anything that improves quality. Um, <clears throat> is this being incorporated generally or was it a more specific thing? Um, I think at the moment, um, you know, I feel like it's probably going to have quite a, uh, you know, increase after COVID because I think that people are really going to want to see specific accountability measures put in place for uh, businesses, developments, hotels, restaurants um, to uphold their end of the bargain. And I think that, you know, kind of as LEED has done that for projects in terms of, you know, materiality and footprint and all of that, I think the well um, standards are going to be doing that, but maybe more for environment and, you know, like air and all of that. And I have actually seen a lot of COVID response on their website being updated. So I think that that will um, probably come to the forefront a lot more. That, that, that's great. <clears throat> but at, at the same time as, as improving our standards through well and other um, certification systems, we're doing the opposite as well, aren't we? Because we're, we're increasing the amount of sanitizers and antibacterial sprays and all those things which effectively kill off nature um, and, and, and effectively reduce our immunity um, so we're actually more susceptible to disease in, 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 as a result. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of a contradiction happening there, isn't it? That, that we're, we're, yeah. we're kind of, um, we, we love nature, but actually when it comes indoors in certain ways, we kill it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it, it's a real shame because there, you know, I think COVID is such an extreme um, virus that it's, you know, it, look, whenever people get confronted with something that is essentially terrifying, you always get fear-based responses. And that often is, you know, over-sanitation, over-sterilization, you know, everyone kind of wanting to get away and make sure that their hands are clean and all of that stuff. And I mean, I'm definitely a big believer that, you know, immunity and, and building up your, you know, natural antibodies and, you know, steering away from bleaches and over sanitization in general is is much more healthy for you um but i think we're going to kind of need to see a little bit more information come through about covid before people will relax on that mm. um so i do think that there's probably going to be a huge focus on very clean environments especially in hospitality spaces where multiple people have been touching surfaces um but i hope that you know, at some point we're going to get educated around COVID enough in order to put that in a separate category and then be able to kind of deal with the rest of the world's, you know, and or nature's germs and, and what nature has to offer you in a much more um, rational sense. But does it mean we're going to have to, we're going to have more kind of easily sanitised surfaces? Is it going to change the sort of finish? I think so. And I think a lot of that will come in with, certain fabrics, um, you know, porous materials. I think that people are going to want to feel like they're in a relatively clean environment. But I do think that there's a difference between a, you know, sort of like hospital feeling, if you will, space that's all white and sterile. Um, I think that we can achieve that through using natural materials still, beautiful wood finishes, you know, a minimalist approach. Um, you know, even lighter material palettes. But I think that we're going to probably steer away from, you know, things like shag carpets and a lot of upholstery. And, you know, people are kind of going to want a little bit more hard surface, probably a lot more wood, I think. Mm. Um, and, and those kind of more natural, but also easily cleanable. And, you know, you can visually tell if they're dirty or not. I think those kind of materials are going to be king for a while, for sure. I mean, it's kind of ironic that wood is actually one of the most sterile materials. It's, it's not so easily cleaned as stainless steel, but um, it, it's a great, great clean material. Yeah. And it's also, I think it really makes people feel comfortable, warm, you mm -hmm. know, connected, all of that. So, you know, I think that I think that that will stay around as, as a top. top and, material. and what about air conditioning? Because that's another another issue, isn't it? That, that I mean, it's vastly improved the quality of life in so many buildings, but but it's also I think a spreader of disease too, it pumps it around the building. And so is yeah. what, how are we gonna handle that one? I mean, I personally, I don't 
like being in air conditioned spaces. I think it like dries your eyes out. You just don't really get fresh air. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a hard, um, it's a hard sell for me. And I actually would like to see the industry move away from a reliance on that in order to make interior spaces work. I mean, there's a whole industry, you know, an architectural philosophy around, you know, ventilating spaces naturally. They're just often a lot smaller than what people want to build. So I think that, you know, I feel like it would actually be great if the world was challenged to build smaller, rely on the natural environment a little bit more and, and steer away from so much, you know, AC and, and, and air con. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's sort of a reliance on developers to kind of come forward and, and want to pursue some of this. And, and it also comes back to design ingenuity to find ways to create buildings which, which are like, like the, the Arabs have done for so many years in, yeah. in the Middle East of, of natural ventilation, of, of using different ways to keep the building warm without actually having to use electricity and, and power, which exactly. is to design. Exactly, 100%, yeah. And, and are you seeing uh, any changes in, I mean, you talk about, <clears throat> obviously we're not going to have so many shag pile carpet, that's good, I'm happy with that. Um, any other changes in colour or natural finishes, any sort of directions that you see things going in? I mean, I do think that at the moment we're seeing a lot of the sort of neutral or nude palette, um, which, you know, is a real reference to nature. I think we're going to see more and more of this kind of, um, tonal range of materials uh, come through. So I think that'll be a, um, you know, design trend, but I do also think it's probably going to be a bit of a longer lasting one where people are going to want to have a, a kind of a calm environment. And I think that that does also tie in with the idea of wellness, um, which is something that's really coming through in hospitality space. But you know, also, I think across, um, you know, culture, this idea of wellness, this idea of mental health, and this idea of well-being um, is, is, is championed at the moment in design. And a lot of that is this calm, aesthetic, nude palettes, you know, natural materials and sort of handcrafted approach to design. And do you think this kind of moment of, of, of the COVID virus it's kind of watershed in change of, of, of design or are there other things from pre-COVID times that are still going strong afterwards? Or, I yeah, know. I mean, I think that a lot of this stuff actually, um, in some ways I think COVID will have expedited some trends that were happening before. So I would say that, um, you know, what we were talking about before in terms of technology, um, that's one of those. I do think that, um, you know, prior to COVID, we were seeing um, this investigation of, of space from, you know, amenity space to guest room space. Um, and, you know, your guest rooms are getting much smaller and we're prioritizing larger social spaces. Um, I think that's probably one that's going to change and be flipped on its head. Um, but also when we're talking about palette and those color tones, I do think that was something we were seeing rising up with this sort of return to a craft-based mentality and neutral palette, wellness, all of that I do think was pre-COVID as well. It's just that COVID will have really kind of solidified that and, and expedited it. So it's interesting that actually we're, <clears throat> we're not being completely changed. Already a lot of those changes were incipient before and, and, and yeah. just continue which is which is good yeah 100 percent. yeah and what about the kind of um uh your, your clients your customers um or, or the market you know how, how do you see that at the moment is, is is it shrunk or is it changing direction and uh, are the money being spent are, are clients coming to you or are they waiting till things cut and yeah a bit of both so we have had um it's been interesting really we you know we have a great relationship with most of our clients where we've been able to discuss this openly with them and you know some of them have chosen to put their projects on hold to kind of be able to evaluate what the new climate looks like and if their plans were still going to be relevant i guess um but other people have actually just ploughed forward and, you know, we've, we've been lucky in terms of a business to keep going and, and have a lot of work still on the cards. But um, I think there's definitely been an apprehension around 
making sure that what is being put out today is going to be relevant tomorrow. Um, and I, I see and hear a lot of uh, focus on flexibility. So people are really wanting, you know, I think they've always wanted flexible space, but uh, I think that that's increasing a lot because, you know, they want to be able to have a space that, um, I guess, uh, responds to these smaller groups but also um, is able to open up and facilitate, you know, larger groupings if that becomes something that we're able to do again, you know. I think people are obviously thinking about their projects as relatively permanent and long-term, so they're kind of just trying to be adaptable right now. Mm -hmm. so, so it is a moment of sort of hiatus in a way, that, that some are kind of hedging their bets and waiting to see how it's gonna go before they commit. Totally, yeah. And, you know, some projects I've actually been, you know, wanting to kind of push people to say, hey, no, like, let's respond to this and see what we can do. But um, I think exactly as you're saying, most people overall are looking to kind of hedge their bets a bit and make sure that they're doing the right thing before they're spending their dollars, <laughs> which is fair enough, obviously. <laughs> well, that's the end of the sort of the, the kind of chat we planned. Um, and we've done about half an hour, so that's pretty good timing. And, <clears throat> and what we could do now is answer some of the questions that people have sent in um, before. Right. Um, before and also during the, the talk. Um, <clears throat> there was um, Christopher Ralston, who is our sales rep at Apartment Zero in Washington, D.C., um, is asking, in response to the question of what are you struggling with most, is is what are lobbies, community rooms, outdoor, and other common areas, other 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 common area spaces going to look like post COVID? We've sort of covered that, but is there anything you, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think what I would add to that is that um, I think a lot of existing hotels. So you know, we're talking about properties that were already open. Um, you know, what we're seeing happening at the moment. Um, and actually, this is a Thompson Hotel we designed in Washington, D.C., so he may be familiar with that property. But what we're doing at the moment is working with them to essentially just reconfigure the furniture layouts, so interior layouts, to abide by the social distancing mm. guidelines. There's not that much more they can do yet. So, you know, one thing is that a lot of these hotel properties um, are lucky because they have quite a... a an expanse of space, tall ceilings, you know, large footprints, which does make people feel a little bit more uh, comfortable, sorry, um, I think being in those interior spaces, but we're reconfiguring things to be, you know, no more than four people in a seating group and everyone maintains the six foot, et cetera. So it's kind mm. of about reconfiguring furniture right now, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um. Nikaya Schneider from Switch Modern uh, Atlanta um, <clears throat> says, do you think the design and budgets for hospitality will start skewing less towards luxury and more towards practicality? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think that they are in some ways um, probably going to get more intertwined because I think that there is going to be a lot of enforced practicality um, with you know, this this post-COVID or, or, you know, during COVID, um, you know, kind of revisiting of, of, of prioritization. But I don't think that luxury will go away. I think that essentially, especially with hospitality spaces, people are, you know, going out socializing and spending their money and they're still going to want a certain experience. They're still going to want to see beautiful light fixtures and have a wonderful experience with their, you know, people within their bubble and and you know sit on wonderfully designed chairs and have a delicious cocktail etc so i don't think that luxury will fall aside but it, it is going to i mean luxury will always be there i mean the people with money will always be prepared to pay for whatever they can get yeah um, but the interesting thing is 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 the other end of the scale is is um are, are we going to to see more design being time being spent on trying to create better spaces for people who, which are less luxurious? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. And I do actually think that that's, to your point before, I do think that was happening more um, before COVID as well than we'd seen. I think the white tablecloth approach 
um, is starting to fall to the wayside a lot with the new generations coming up and wanting more of a connection and a certain, you know, I think <clears throat> luxury these days is, is defined, I think, more by experience than a uh, isolated, uh, you know, an isolated experience is not what people are looking for is what I'm trying to say. So I think rather than sitting at your white tablecloth and it's just you and one person, people are much more happy to sit in a grouping around a cocktail table and kind of have a more casual dialogue. So it kind of depends what you think of as luxury, but I think that old school approach to luxury is definitely going mm. to go away more and more. Mm. I don't mind that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, Chiara Zano Zanolin, a student from New York School of Interior Design. Hi there, Chiara. Um, what sustainable design practices do you believe work best and should be implemented in the hospitality industry? You know, that's a, that's a good and tricky question. I, I, If I was being completely honest, I don't think that we have a huge amount of very effective sustainable design practices in terms of full building construction. Um, I think that there's a huge reliance on materials that can't be reused, that don't stand the test of time, um, and that, you know, project budgets are still what drives, you know, most most projects to even be constructed. I think that, um, I hope that COVID actually challenges a little bit of that. And, you know, as we talked about before, um, you know, a connection with nature and a, and a bit more of a focus on materiality comes into play. Um, but, you know, I still think that the building industry and design industry that, you know, I exist within is, is actually extremely unsustainable, um, mm. to be honest. So, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the things that bothers me about the industry is, is the need to constantly redecorate and, and have a new, a new look, a new decor every so often. And, yeah. and think, of, think of all those bars in Europe, in, in, in the cities in Europe, in, in France, in Paris, in Milan. Um, they haven't changed their decor in 30, 40, 50 years, and they're still packed okay. out. They, they don't need to do that. And that's far, surely far more sustainable than this, this, as you say, short term use materials which wear out very quickly. And mm. they know they're going to wear out quickly, and that's fine because they're going to change it all in a few years. Mm. That, that's very, very unsustainable. And, and I think we need to start valuing good quality stuff that will last. Um, and, and, and not expect it to be changed every few years. Yeah, and be timeless, exactly as you're saying. And I think that, I mean, a fear of mine that we, you know, mm. that COVID will bring is this, you know, even more temporary. You know, mm. people are putting up plastic screens and temporary partitions and all of this. And honestly, even this reliance on face masks and plastic gloves, as much as they're important, I definitely am not saying they're not important, but you know, is there a sustainable way that we can start, you know, implementing those measures as well, rather than having disposable, more disposable plastics, et cetera, um, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem is that the, the cheapest one is the immediate solution, but it's not always the, the, the what well, invariably isn't the best one in the longer term. No, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Sam Martin, interior design and architect, um, <clears throat> asks, how can we maximize the use of timber for indoor and outdoor purposes? Hmm, um, I mean, I would say we, I'm not sure 100% what that question means, but um, I think that timber is used a lot in indoor and exterior um, applications. I would say that just as we talked about, I think that um, there's a lot of reliance on veneer and cheap uh, woods and applications and not real proper timber that's been treated for conditions to last a long time. Um, so I would say that that's, you know, got really using proper solid wood, hard wood in the right environments would be a way that we could, um, you know, maximize its use if that's what that question meant. But I do think that there's, you know, most uh, exterior and interior hospitality spaces do have a lot of wood um, mm. already. I mean, when I compare it to 10, 10, 15 years ago, I see far more wood and, I think, and solid wood furniture. And I think that's great. Yeah, totally. I just worry that, that I hope there's enough to, trees to, to supply the demand. Well, exactly. Not if we're chucking it out after, you know, 15 years or something, right? That's the thing is it's if we can design more sustainably then probably, but yeah. yeah. 
Um, Natalie Scheutz, uh, interior design and architect. Um, public spaces and people wanting to be together rather than their rooms. This, this is what she's struggling with in terms of design for hospitality, designing public spaces and, and the fact that people want to be together rather than, how, how do you overcome that? We sort of covered that already, I think, haven't we? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Joan Riggs, how do we get the general public to understand design significance to the built environment? Does, has COVID opened that door? How do you get the general public to design significance? How do we get the general public to understand the significance of design in the built environment, the importance of design? Has, has COVID sort of opened that door a bit? Yeah, I mean, actually, that's a great point. I, I, I hope that that's the case. I mean, I do think living somewhere like New York, um, there's a huge focus on your aesthetic environment. So I do think people are um quite focused on design anywhere anyway but i do think globally this probably has increased that because people are so conscious of their physical environments um and i do think that people are going to probably have a much more uh, focused opinion on on where they go so yeah i hope that that does raise a bit of awareness to good design and, and well-designed spaces as opposed to you know, kind of cheap and fast, I guess. Um, so yeah, yeah, I can see that happening. John makes the point that poorly designed space can endanger your health. So yeah. I think that's good design is really important, isn't it? 100%, yeah. And I actually think that, you know, COVID's also raised this point of mental health and how people are doing without each other without this kind of social interaction and i think that spatial design in your interior environment definitely has an effect on that so you know if we're in poorly designed spaces you know catching a virus is one thing but actually just you know feeling depressed or down or you know run out of energy and all of that is is a big um factor as well yeah and i mean that's a challenge to us as designers is is, is to overcome that and, and and make people feel better feel feel more comfortable feel more positive um that's yeah. got to be good to help them with with coping with this 100 percent. yeah i totally agree um <clears throat> the, sam martin also had another question um what projects have most excited you with regards to the use of outdoor space um you know, I think going forward, definitely hotels. I think that I'm very excited to see how we can plan better um, with larger scale projects that include the outdoors more. I think that in a lot of cities, um, you know, things like green roofs haven't been explored nearly enough. Um, you know, for example, we did a hotel in Nashville that it didn't have a green roof, but it was the first roof that was in that city that you could even access, um, which was crazy to me. So I think that there's a lot of unused space and unused potential with the outdoors in terms of connection there. Um, and I think, you know, my passion is very much in hospitality spaces in hotels, getting people together, you know, socializing and, and building community that way. And I think that the more that we can bring outdoor space into that environment is, is very exciting. Um, Joan Riggs also asks, how do we get the general public to understand, oh, that's the same question, it's put in twice, sorry. Um, uh -huh. One last question, um, Stephanie Elzen, um, <clears throat> one thing she's struggling with is keeping the open concept look with, with separation for social distancing. Again, I think that's sort of um, <clears throat> fairly much what we've covered, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that, that was the, the questions that we had. Um, I think we've, we've done pretty well. We've, we've been nearly three, three quarters of an hour. So um, awesome. that's, that's been a good run. And thank you, Diana. Thanks so great. much for having me, uh, David. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone to tuning in. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, kake, kake, kake tiano. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.